Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, we are going to talk about contagion, closely associated with contamination or even infection, uh, which is defined as the action or state of, of basically being made impure, some kind of pollution or, or poisoning. And that can take place on a number of, of levels from the strictly sort of biological, environmental pollutants or contagion sources to what we get from people, kinds of infections uh, that are transmitted person to person. Uh, there's a sense of morality of what is pure or right or good and how we get infected with dangerous ideas. It's often marked by disgust, uh, which is a universal human emotion, and it is also universally marked by the same facial expression, uh, and we all know what it is. Of course, there is also psychic infection or psychological uh, sense of uh, being affected. And with all that as a kind of maybe an outline for us to circumambulate, let's jump in. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is the etymology of the word. And in Latin, it's the contagio, which in its most fundamental way means to contact through touch. Just the idea of touch is somehow involved in the passing of some ambivalent agent from one person to the other. And that can mean so many different things, archetypally as well as quite literally. There's a, a lot of thought around purity laws and ritual purifications and this evolutionary idea that it's a quasi-hygienic principle that shows up around these ancient concerns of purity and impurity. But all of it has to do with whether or not we have touched something. Literally, in the ancient world, it might be a fear of leprosy, which I think has an echo right now to our fears of viral contagions moving around through the culture. But it also could be something that seems to displease the god of the tribe, which then could put us at risk by touching it in some way. So at the root of it, I think we have this fear and concern around touching and passing something from the other into ourselves that will have a negative impact in one way or another. Yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, and I wish I could quote more about this kind of chapter and verse, but I believe that a lot of 
ancient practices around dietary prescriptions, for example, or other kind of rituals or uh, group behaviors that have been enforced often in, in religions are traced, they're suspected to have a basis in disease avoidance. So it's almost like somehow human culture intuited that certain practices might lead to the spread of illness and created these kind of religious pro prohibitions against certain things. You know, and now we understand this and we, we understand the, the nature of contamination and we understand germs and, and viruses and we have a scientific understanding of it. But before there was a scientific understanding of it, you know, human beings were being stalked by the invisible. And in fact, you know, even though we understand it, we still are because the contagions that we fear are invisible things, uh, viruses and bacterial infections. We, we, can't, we can't see them. There's a way that this has very deep evolutionary roots that disgust and the behaviors around disgust are seen as disease avoidance instincts. And it's even referred to, disgust is even referred to as a behavioral immune system. I'm already aware of the interface or overlap uh, between biological and psychological, that these perhaps uh, disease avoidance kinds of behaviors took on a uh, religious or ritual significance that uh, if we do this, that, or the other thing, we will be able to maintain purity or we can cleanse ourselves after possible contamination by performing certain uh, rites. So it quickly and easily, perhaps instinctively as well, moved into emotions psychology, and that universal uh, facial expression of disgust. I think the instinct of disgust, which is well-researched in newborn infants, it's so ingrained into our bodies, has such a powerful influence on what we move towards or what we move away from. And also, it has a strange impact on the fetishization of things, that when we come across something that we find disgusting on an instinctive level, it is also a state of arousal. There's a bit of adrenaline in it. The senses are very heightened. The mind speeds up a bit because we're evaluating for danger. And when that then is associated, for instance, with sexual excitation, it creates a very confusing world of fetishization. So Deb, I love that you were lifting up sort of the the biological piece and then there's the psychological piece. And I think we're right mm -hmm. there at that intersection. And I'm reminded of Jung saying that the archetype is an image of instinct. So we're talking about the disgust instinct as a way to try to manage contagion. And we have to know that there's an archetype at play there. So there are archetypal forces that we're subject to when we become afraid of contagion, when we begin to practice rituals aimed at purifying us or cleaning us. And so, you know, I mean, we, we are psychological beings that live in an archetypal realm, at least part of the time. And so when we're using hand sanitizer, We've got our little container of hand sanitizer that we keep in our, our bag or our pocket and we take it out all the time and, and sanitize. Partly that is a rational behavior that's driven by science, that's driven by public health information, but it has a psychological and archetypal element mm -hmm. where what we're doing is kind of ritually cleansing ourselves to shield ourselves from illness. So there is an apotropaic aspect to this, that this will be the guard uh, against evil, you know? Like It'll keep magic. us safe. Yes. and But it's also this kind of magical talisman yes. 
uh, with a kind of bargaining dynamic underneath it that if I do this, uh, various uh, bad things won't happen. It's like gargoyles on churches that scare away, you know, evil spirits or the evil eye kind of thing. So there is a psychological component uh, as well as the science. And long before there was any kind of germ theory had emerged into consciousness, people were taking ritual bathing as a way of removing some kind of spiritual stain or impurity from the soul so that one could be pleasing both to God and to the religious community. So this instinct that we have as human beings, that water and washing or being emerged in water somehow allows us to restore a relationship to the thing that we had been alienated from, which brings us to the word atonement, at one mint. So when we are in the contagion or there is some suggestion of impurity, one of the first instinctive and ritual actions that many cultures would do would be to separate you out. And whether that's in some ancient situation where the menstruating women were set aside, ostensibly because it was a sign that they were not pregnant and there was a loss of opportunity for fertility and that non-fertility was considered so threatening to the tribe that the non-fertility of the menstruating woman could not affect the rest of the tribe safely. So they were kind of set aside so that it didn't get propagated among the tribe members. So I think what's valuable about that ancient idea, which of course is no longer relevant um, in the modern world with what we have available through science, is that anything that seemed to be anti-life, anything that seemed to make us not godlike or pleasing to the divine, anything that put us at risk in one way or another carried a kind of spiritual dimension or archetypal dimension, as well as whatever it may have meant on the physical level. And that that spiritual sense or superstitious sense of something being transmitted by being in the proximity of something is something that we're all dealing with and resurfaces again and again in modern culture, despite the fact that we may have science to back up a particular perspective and may speak in that way for why modern folks are still resistant to making decisions purely based on scientific fact, because there's another voice inside of them that's ancient and is mixing the archetypal and the scientific world together. And often because the archetypal level carries this incredible numinous potency, we will tend to favor the archetypal because it feels more powerful versus facts that can seem really dry. Well, and in addition, when there's a lack of facts, when there is an area we don't know, you know, the truth is that we always project the contents of the unconscious into the unknown. So, you know, you, and Jung had this beautiful metaphor for that. He said in ancient maps, where the the cartographers didn't know what was beyond the edge of the map, they would draw sea monsters. So we project the contents of the unconscious onto that which we do not know. And any area of developing knowledge, there's going to be gaps in knowledge. So for example, there's a lot we don't know about COVID. There's a lot we don't know about the new variants of COVID. And I, I think that we're all every single one of us projecting contents of the unconscious onto these unknown areas. You know, and this is something that it, it's important to say, we don't realize we're doing this. Right. This is totally unconscious. So back to the the thing that, that I was talking about a minute ago, when we take out our hand sanitizer, we're rationally thinking this is a good thing to do because it will protect me from germs and help keep me from getting sick. And of course, that's true. But we're not probably aware of the way that we're enacting an ancient ritual that we see, as, as you were saying, Deb, is apotropaic and involves a certain degree of bargaining. 
Mm-hmm. And and you can hear this when someone when you, when someone gets the news that someone else is sick, right? The first thing we want to say is, "Oh well, did they X?" You know, you you hear that someone I don't know has lung cancer, and the first thing you think is, "Was he or she a smoker?" Because if the person were is a smoker, then it's like, "Oh well, I don't smoke," so that means I'm not going to get it. And, and there's this way that we we want to enact these rituals, these purifying rituals, like using hand sanitizer, to en- ensure that we are among those who are pure. And then there's a belief that we will be saved, that we will be protected. By assigning causality, it can propagate this myth that we are more powerful than we really are, that there's a simple solution, and that we can feel secure and calm. Yes. As long as we enact the ritual, whether it's the ritual of the hand sanitizer or in the Middle Ages, there was an enormous traffic in the bones of saints mm-hmm. that people would, would go to great lengths and spend great amounts of money to get the pinky of St. Teresa and put it in a locket. And there was a guarantee that this would protect one from the plague, particularly. Mm. I think hand sanitizer is probably a little more effective than <laughs> somebody's bones, but it still goes to the feeling tone you're saying is mm-hmm. this aura of calmness that the archetype can evoke. So what it's really protecting us from is a kind of existential anxiety that yeah. can be yes. intolerable over time. And yes. it's, it's like you've made a bargain with the deity, right? And and right. you need you need to make a bargain with the deity because this is an unseen adversary. Right. There's a magical feeling tone about it, even though mm-hmm. it is has a scientific reality. Right. And that masks as well the shrouding of the face, provides as well as perhaps some medical and scientific protection, but also the shrouding of the body has been an ancient kind of protection, a kind of layer, whether it's going into the Ark of the Covenant and having a kind of talus uh, over wearing a yarmulke in the Catholic Church back in the earlier days. Uh, by earlier, I mean like the 40s and the 30s. You know, my uh, grandmother and all the women wore very special little handkerchiefs they would pin to the tops of their heads, which was part of this shrouding as a way of relating to the sacred and to the numinous. So, Even the masking has a tone, an irrational and universal tone that gives us a sense that we are complying with something greater than ourselves. I'm picking up on the invisibility uh, aspect of this, of what is mysterious, what is invisible, the compensatory uh, ritual, physical shroudings, veilings, coverings, you know, anything that we can actually do that that can be perceived by the ego, of that these are things we can do. I can assign causality to this. I can make a deal or feel like I've made a deal by doing certain kinds of uh, what I believe are protective things. I want to uh, just read something that Jung had to say that I think bears on on all of this. Uh, He says that the extreme consequence is the dissolution of the ego, okay, parens, by a pathogen, in the unconscious, a state resembling death. It results from the more or less complete identification of the ego with unconscious factors, or as we would say, from contamination. This is what the alchemists experienced as immunditia or pollution. They saw it as the defilement of something transcendent by the gross and opaque body, which had for that reason to undergo sublimation or purification. Uh, But the body, psychologically speaking, is the expression of our individual and conscious existence. We then feel is in danger of being swamped or poisoned by the unconscious. And I think that divide between ego, the need for causality, the need for uh, feeling that there are control measures, actions, 
and the unconscious, which Jung says in the body is basically unreachable mm -hmm. uh, by our minds. You know, my joke is always that no one has any idea what their spleen is doing. It doesn't matter how much you you think about it, read about it, meditate, or go into a reverie. Um, it's unreachable. And that's scary. Mm -hmm. So we compensate for it. So when I think about the poisoning that can rise up from the unconscious and distort the ego's functioning, which of course puts it at risk in the world, I'm thinking about the degree to which our culture is fighting against being poisoned by fear. That however we're orienting to an epidemic or, or even a personal diagnosis that could be devastating for that matter, that on top of whatever the concrete physical challenges are to it, it's the fear that the unconscious will rise up and swallow us in a state of terror, which we will not be able to escape. And I think that quality of horror is sometimes equally as painful as whatever physical limits yeah. that we're dealing with. And what we see in our culture right now, whether it shows up in politics or policies and what we expect to do for our kids if they go back to school, is all this monstrous leviathan of fear. And people are figuring out how to negotiate with that. And whether it's they rise up in anger they're kind of yelling at their school boards or they retreat into a state of extraordinary isolation and self-protection or everything in between. And it's almost like uh, fear is the thing. It's been constellated and, and different people decide to be fearful of different things. It's sort of like, and of what are you afraid? That has a, a real world a sort of scientific base often, but it's also symbolic, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yes. Of, of what people are particularly skittish about, disgusted by, and just plain scared of. Mm -hmm. But I'm also aware that this idea of uh, contagion and contaminant has a very um, modern day mythological correlate in that series, The Walking Dead. Uh, so here, here's the um, spoiler alert mm -hmm. that it was it was a virus and ooh, everybody had it, but some people uh, were asymptomatic and other people, uh, sadly and unfortunately, turned into uh, zombies, uh, which in my view was a miracle of casting and costume creation. The other modern myth, I mean, it's ancient, but it has had a resurgence in uh, recent years, let's say the last 50 years, is vampires who uh, have a horrible uh, contagion effect on their victims. They not uh, only can drain them of blood, but they can also create new vampires. And so there is the contagion and what happens then you become uh, famously in vampire speak, one of the undead. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that you're a vector, you know? Yes, exactly. And then you spread the contagion because of your own insatiable need, uh, having been infected. And so it goes, and that's the way vampires propagate. You know, there's something, I, I appreciate you bringing up uh, uh, The Walking Dead, because there's something so poignant about this idea that we all have it. Mm -hmm. And and there's something important there psychologically that I want to lean into, which is that, you know, when this kind of, um, let's call it an archetype of purity or an archetype of apopatriac protection gets constellated, that this kind of disease avoidance archetype or instinct gets constellated, you know, it's like these these sort of group hygiene practices get sort of propagated symbolically. And there are then these cultural rules about separation and pollution and purity. And that can create these separation between social groups. And it's sort of enforced by social rules and by manners. And what can happen is that we can have the clean and the unclean. So, and if you're part of the unclean, there, there's great, great shame. So I'm thinking about, 
you know, when my kids were little and there would be an outbreak of lice. Oh, that's a big one. The school would send home an email and they were always very careful not to name the kids who had the lice. But of course, everyone wanted to know who is it? <laughs> and, and, you know, they would be very yeah. careful to say, well, and lice really like clean hair because there's, you know, there's this, I mean, if you have lice, you you must be filthy, right? There's And, and there's this deep, very visceral, ancient archetypal feeling of sort of impurity, disgust, shame, and exile if you're the one who has the kid who has the lice, right? So we can all relate to that. And of course, this can be really dangerous on a cultural level to start believing that some people are pure and some people are impure, because that can be, and and unfortunately has been throughout history, the basis upon which there's been, you know, horrible mistreatment of certain groups who were seen as being impure or carrying a disease or, uh, or other undesirable qualities. And then we're into the realm of shadow and projecting shadow. So, and this is kind of going back to the walking dead. If I'm the one who's uh, sanitizing my hands every day, then I have to be one of the holy and pure ones. And if, someone gets sick in my vicinity, it has to be because of something someone else did, because I'm pure. So there, there goes shadow projection, right? Like I'm pure, I've done everything, I think, right? And we were talking about how this is kind of bargaining in nature, and, and you can't really know that you're not the one who's communicated the disease. But you can believe that you are, and you can believe that it's the fault of someone else, and of course, from a public health perspective, there are things that you can do to minimize the spread of disease, especially on a population level. But when we interact with this as, as um, beings with an archaic psyche, <laughs> you know, we impose these kind of rules about purity and impurity, and we see it through this archetypal lens. And the last sort of reference that I want to bring in is um, if there was an outbreak in a medieval village, there was an outbreak of disease. A lot of times it was assumed that it was because that that strange old woman who lived at the edge of town mm -hmm. uh, was a witch and had caused the infection to spread. And so there it is again, that we do this very human, but very kind of primal thing of running this through our our archetypal framework, reading this as about purity versus impurity and projecting shadow out onto there, onto the other, that it's, it's not us, it's them. Right. And so again, this false assurance that if we can name any causality and convince ourselves, it's that old woman. In other yeah. ancient cultures, they might actually depose the king and sacrifice him mm -hmm. because the king and the land are one. And if something goes bad, whether it's the crops or leprosy or the plague, it's because something's wrong with the king. Got to get him out of here. Got to get somebody who's healthier, etc. Yes. More vigorous, young, youthful, potent. Uh, so we're, we've landed in the realm of the scapegoat. Exactly. That's what I was thinking. You know, there's an ancient ritual where, if there's an impurity in the tribe that you would sprinkle blood on a bird and water and then send it to fly off. And mm. the fantasy is that as the bird flies off, it takes the impurity, the sin, the darkness away with it and all kinds of versions of that. So driving the one that we have instinctively assigned the problem to is somehow going to save the tribe. And perhaps in rare occasions that was true isolating somebody that actually was carrying some kind of sure. a massive, there's there's you know, illness. like a kind of you know inherent sense to this in this kind of yeah. rough way yeah. but then it's also shadow making because mm -hmm. when it's purely a psychological component banishing the one who's evidencing the psychological behavior just pushes it into the unconscious and then it comes up in other forms because the unconscious won't be denied yeah, so whether right perfect. now we we have an enormous conflict in the United States where certain communities 
are taking over school boards and deciding you can't teach your children about slavery because the idea that shame will somehow be passed into the prevailing culture and that children will somehow be infected by shame is now taken on a kind of mythic proportion so kids can't be taught about the horrors of slavery as part of the U.S. government. It has to all be a very pleasant, whitewashed fairy tale, lest children walk away with a burden of shame. I'm relating what you've said to add shame. Uh, we've talked about exile. Uh, we've talked about disgust. <laughs> we've talked about fear. Uh, all of these kinds of things. And uh, what Jung s says, basically, is that the cure for, he calls it possession, but we could call it infection, contamination, they possess us. The cure is suffering. And what we do, I think, is to uh, conflate physical disease and suffering and si uh, external world situations, such as school curricula, with the internal states that we wish to avoid instead of suffering consciously, the, the fear, the shame, the pain, the anxiety, the disgust, instead of making that conscious, we externalize it and, and project it. And that that's, you know, such a huge part of shadow is these feelings that we want to avoid. And it doesn't mean that they're unconnected with the physical world, but uh, we tend to put everything onto uh, the physical rather than acknowledge, what am I doing? How am I feeling? What's my reaction? What's going on inside me? And something has fallen out of the collective, which is a drum that I bang all the time, that reality is medicinal. <laughs> that facts are friendly, and that if we can reorient our thinking to accommodate new facts and new information about reality, the more adaptive and successful we'll be. And when we defend against reality, that's one of the definitions of being neurotic, mm -hmm. that I'm not attuned to the reality of a situation. And, and whether that's keeping me in a job that I shouldn't be in, where I'm underpaid and underappreciated, or that I'm refusing to allow my child to experience any sense of failure, so therefore they can never be given an honest critique by their school system, or they're not allowed to get anything less than an A because it will make them feel bad, and yet they must confront reality and tolerate the fact that sometimes you don't get an A. So we do this, and then we impose it on our children by trying to protect them from reality. And I think that then we bring forward generations of people who expect to be protected from reality and demand and expect that any of their defenses against reality must be supported by the system because reality itself then is interpreted as harmful. Mm -hmm. And then we begin to hear people saying, you are harming me by introducing me to reality. And at that point, the culture is in trouble. And certainly that person's in trouble and as much as their ability to function is going to be deeply compromised. I'm thinking about, Deb, you, you said that the antidote was suffering. And, and I want to say, in, in some sense, I think another antidote is, is going back to The Walking Dead to realize we all are carriers of the disease, whatever the disease is. And I'm speaking metaphorically and psychologically here. But to remember that, that we, we all carry the disease. And in evaluating uh, behaviors or, or decisions, it's probably impossible to tease out what impulse comes from uh, hard scientific knowledge to the extent that we have it versus what is coming from our old uh, archetypal brain. And maybe it's just important to know that, that both things may be in play for any of us at all times is that all things are pairs of opposites, that the healthy and the sick all exist on a spectrum of physical functioning. 
that can't be broken into parts. Mm -hmm. And that even those who are at the pinnacle of health are kind of Olympic athletes that are these kind of paragons of health and, and power that in the unconscious of such people is a feeble internal image that is unwell. And in everyone who is deeply sick, there is somewhere in the unconscious an image of radiant health because the psyche is set up in pairs of syzygies or opposites and that the soul cannot function without that. So the saint in the center and all the other polarities interpenetrate each other. And if we were to give up working so hard to make the opposite invisible, we would all be much more whole and much more oriented to reality in terms of the decisions we make and the policies we set in motion. So I wanted to come back again to suffering, as you were saying, Deb, and the way that we avoid legitimate suffering, which is a discipline, a kind of psycho-spiritual discipline that as Jungians we take on, versus avoiding reasonable suffering that we could avoid. There are some kinds of sufferings and mistakes that we can just make a better choice and we don't have to live out some shit show of our own making. <laughs> Amen. Yes. And that's a huge distinction, isn't it, of uh, what is really unnecessary suffering and what is the legitimate suffering that would grow us if we were to face it and deeply consider it instead of simply scapegoating people, assigning false causalities, and doing all the things that we do to split the opposites of that. That's not me. For us, what if it what if it were you? What if it were me? What happens here with this? And I'm thinking about uh, sort of an analogy to uh, the analytic container, you know, where Jung says, you know, that the the client or patient, as he termed it, and the analyst have to mutually infect each other. And without that kind of uh, chemical reaction, which he compared it to, nothing would happen. And that's a lovely metaphor for uh, being willing to approach, being, being willing to engage versus uh, shying away, blaming, shaming, projecting, and all the other things we've talked about. Of there are we can't avoid psychic infection. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking back to the etymology of the word, and uh, Joseph, as you shared earlier, and it literally comes from these two Latin words, con and tangere, so to touch together. And there's this idea that when we make contact with that which is contaminated, we also become contaminated. So if you um, I don't know, drop your pencil on the floor of the public toilet. The pencil <laughs> feels contaminated until either some time has gone by or maybe you wash it or something like that. But that's also a psychological principle that if someone is uh, suffering, for example, let's say someone's uh, experienced a terrible loss, you know, we can wa avoid wanting to touch that person because we don't want to become contaminated with that. And somehow being, being able to open ourselves up to that is, is an important part of being with one another. So there's the therapeutic cross-pollination that happens when we are in a deep, vulnerable relationship. And whether that's in the analytic relationship or with family members or loved ones that we can't deny the cross pollination. Now, when we say cross pollination, it sounds so attractive. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> when we talk about the sharing of contagions, it sounds more burdensome and more frightening, but it's still that same image of these little particles of psychological or physical matter wind up getting inhaled by various groups of people who are near each other, and how do we find a stance, an attitude, to accept that that happens, psycho-spiritually at the very least, and 
even more fully, as Jung was talking about in the alchemical work, to welcome it as an agent of maturation and change and whole making. Although, as you would mentioned, Deb, there is no small amount of suffering involved in every change process. That as human beings, we do not intrinsically gravitate towards radical changes of behavior or attitude because it's costly and it leaves us in a state of uncertainty or even quite frankly diminished skill you know if you're hunting with a bow and arrow and you have some level of success but somebody comes forward and says oh i've got these five better ways to do it you can be sure that while you're trying to add those five better ways to use your bow and arrow your skill set's going to drop way down and you're going to probably be able to or lose the capacity to hunt at the level you were before. And it takes a fair amount of forward thinking to be willing to add in something that will eventually be better because I'll have to sacrifice a certain amount of loss of capacity in the beginning. I really appreciate that example of uh, that there's the, there's the suffering is the loss of capacity uh, to hunt while this learning curve and this growth and enlargement of of skill, the promise of better skill is being practiced. It's such a great analogy to exactly what happens between the ego and the unconscious of it costs us to engage in things that feel painful psychologically of to forego a belief that I maybe have had, you know, I was raised with it, and I have to let that go. Uh, I have to do all kinds of things in the service of greater consciousness or better, greater bow and arrow skills, and suffer the dissolution of my my satisfaction with myself. And how I operate and what is, and I know things. Uh, So each time, one way or another, the ego really has to be willing to take a hit for the promise of of moreness, of growth, maturation, uh, clear sightedness, versus sticking with uh, the already known. You know, whether it's a bow and arrow skill or uh, relational and meaning-making functions of consciousness. And it is hard to let them go. I wanted to swing around also, because I think it's interesting, to a couple of other movies, perhaps, that are bringing this forward. Certainly, The Walking Dead is is a very interesting uh, story, particularly because everyone is clearly infected by this virus because... If you die on that show or in that world, so to speak, up for any cause, sooner or later, you'll kind of become a zombie. So there's this kind of latent virus, a zombie virus in everyone that creates a problem. (laughs) I was also thinking about a movie that came out, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, called Bird Box. And it was a horror movie. And basically, this kind of supernatural intelligence takes over public media and this video begins to circulate through these various channels and simply watching the images on this video is so overwhelming that whoever sees it when it's done immediately turns and commits suicide in a way that is unstoppable and irresistible and the only way to survive this is to wrap bandages around your eyes, a blindfold, and kind of move through the world hoping to find some kind of safe space. So in that movie, the contaminant comes through looking, that even just seeing something and having the image touch the psyche Mm. is enough to create an infection that is Um, unstoppable and unhandleable. And so the the purity practice, so to speak, is to wrap blindfolds (laughs) around your eyes or your children's eyes 
and to be forced to move through the world kind of fumbling and touching and using any of the other senses to try to figure out how to be adequately safe from these images. And that's something we also see in the culture right now, being contaminated by images and ideas. And what do we do to cover, avert our eyes so as not to have something stay and spin around in our heads and quote unquote, make us crazy and self-harming. And that's, I thought, a very poignant, timely, dystopian theme that popped up in this movie. And I think actually it caught the public imagination for a little while as well. Well, it certainly speaks to our fear of contagion and, and how out of control it feels that that were it not for these purity practices, whether they're kind of scientifically based or in this horror film, or if you want to call it superstition, you know, that if I carry the finger of the saint around, I won't get sick, that, that we have to find something to protect ourselves against this seemingly unstoppable enemy. And often the enemy is categorized in just actually a few small ways it's associated with death, it's associated with sex, or it's associated with something that will make us alienated from the divine. And everything that we put in those categories carries that archetypal patina of the impure, the dangerous, the contagious, the thing that society or the individual must distance from at all costs. You know, I want to um, pick up on your mentioning this movie, Bird Box, and we just revisited The Walking Dead. And that adds the element that we haven't mentioned yet of horror. And horror and possession are very much intertwined, that we lose ourselves. There's no self anymore. And uh, Marie-Louise von Franz um, says that she, in her experience as a practitioner, and she was a very close colleague and a prolific writer of Jung's, uh, said that that is the worst thing she knows of, is to be possessed. So I think it's worth just sort of um, adding that as a feeling tone and an idea that it's not just getting sick, it's not just something bad happening, it's what if I lose myself and am possessed by this invisible, unknown horror? A and uh, COVID has been a horror, let's just say it plainly. Uh, that goes uh, beyond scapegoating, shame, blame, denial, projection, et cetera, it really amps up the feeling tone uh, associated with contagion. Yeah, and of course, horror and disgust, I think, sit pretty close together. Mm -hmm. And Deb, what you were thinking of made me also think about parasites, because parasites can take us over, and, and that happens in some really horrific ways in the insect kingdom, at least, that I'm thinking about. And again, our knowledge of these things pre-scientific era came from these these instincts and, and this sort of uh, collective archetypal wisdom about this and how to protect ourselves and, and the, the sheer horror of being taken over by something else. So I, th I think I think you know sort of the theme today has been that we exist in this realm, that is both informed by scientific, rational information, but always and forever, our imaginations, our decisions are fed from an underwater stream of image and instinct and archetype and emotion. And that we are profoundly vulnerable to both being colonized by images and information from the culture and deeply vulnerable 
to be over-influenced by unconscious material that races into us from the collective unconscious and from these archetypal realms, and that so much of Jung's hope was that the ego could become strong enough and oriented enough through wisdom and experience to be able to straddle these various worlds and negotiate with these tremendous feelings and information and chart a course that's both creative and beneficent. And maybe that's a good time to switch to a dream. I just want to remind you all too that if you're interested in working with your dreams, you should consider signing up for our 12-month online course called Dream School. We've got lots of resources there to help you learn about your dreams and we'll also get to spend special time each month with each of us. So we hope to see you in Dream School. Today's dream comes from a 36-year-old woman who works as a stripper. And here's the dream. I'm in Mexico traveling with my mom, my dad, and my brother. We are invited to a child's birthday party. As a gift decoration, I bring 12 golden retriever puppies. They are all tied together on a long, thin blue nylon rope. The rope is looped around each puppy's belly, and there is a couple of feet of rope between each puppy. When we arrive at the party, which is in a domestic courtyard, my father hangs the rope of puppies high on a wall in a square spiral shape. I express my concern that the puppies are hanging from the ropes, at which point my dad shows me that he has placed a brass-colored nail into the wall at each puppy node. The nails stick out from the wall a few inches, and the puppies can sit on the nails, he explains to me. I agree with him, though it seems unrealistic to me that a puppy could be comfortable balancing on such a small surface. As I look at them, they are in fact struggling to keep their perches, though many of them are still wagging their tails. My father criticizes me for bringing home these 12 puppies and asks me what I'm going to do with them. I realize I have nowhere to take them as we are all staying in a hotel room and the smell of their pee and poop would overwhelm the rest of my family. I realize with some horror that I'm going to have to kill them or just release them onto the streets where they will suffer and slowly die of starvation and neglect. I rack my brain for the right execution method. Drowning? Put them in plastic bags in the freezer? I am horrified at either prospect. I sit down at a table to discuss this with other party attendees. No one is taking me very seriously, but someone does scornfully point out that I have several other kinds of animals in groups of 12 that I also have to figure out how to dispatch in some way. I can't remember now what all those animals were, except a group of mice, which were already shrouded and drowning slowly in a large glass ashtray on the picnic table. There is also a group of dolphins, but there are four of them. They are only toys and only the heads kind of like finger puppets. When I submerge them in a bucket of water, they seem to come to life, however. I continue to agonize about my responsibility to do something with all of these dozens of little animals and announce to the group that my inclination to kill the puppies is at least merciful and correct because they have been exposed to jet fuel, which has permanently damaged their abdominal organs. Someone, an adult man I don't recognize, points out to me that their abdominal organs are actually being dislocated and harmed because they have fallen off their impossibly small perches and are hanging from the little blue ropes. I take one off the wall and look at his belly, which is red and distended, especially on one side. I feel sick with guilt and totally overwhelmed with my inability to take care of by either caring for or murdering these sweet, patient, naive little dogs. Here's the context. I am frustrated and ashamed that I make so little money, have no real job or any of the other trappings of adult life. I feel inferior and incapable in my daily life. I am also very sick and experience a great deal of distress around illness that is centered in my abdominal organs. And the feelings were apprehension, guilt, 
frustration, sorrow, and distress. And finally, she notes that I dream of my father frequently. He is often driving me somewhere in my dreams, and we often disagree about what I or he should be doing. I also dream frequently that I am hurt or threatened, and he is unable to help or protect me. My great reaction to this dream instantly is, uh, is I feel the tears in me about this dream and, and for the dreamer. And the reason that I report that out is that one's own re felt reaction to a dream uh, is important information about the dream for the dreamer that I think I could be picking up something that the dreamer is feeling and I want to hand it back. This is such a very powerful emotional dream. Yes, Deb, I too felt uh, like I was going to start crying as I read it. And, um, you know, she does note that she felt sorrow, but I think the feelings that you and I are having are perhaps an indication that there's some sadness that she hasn't yet claimed or felt. And that this, this sadness, um, it's in multiples of 12 uh, with the four dolphins at the end, but all kinds of animals that represent uh, our innocent and instinctual and naive aspects of ourselves that need to be taken care of. Uh, that need tenderness and protection. And they, these are parts of, of her, of where are her internal uh, puppies, mice, dolphins, uh, and other creatures. And she reports out at the end uh, that she's having a hard time in her waking life. I think with her career, I feel inferior and incapable in my daily life, frustrated, ashamed, I make so little money. And she's experiencing abdominal uh, physical symptoms as well. Uh, I think this dream overall is really asking for her attention. I'd like to cut to the chase. Okay. So the tension here is between these instinctive animal images, which represent, of course, the instinctive animal parts of all of us as human beings, how she relates to them, and how she responds to how other people relate to them. So in the beginning, we have the first troubled attitude. She's been invited to a party, and she has brought 12 golden retriever puppies as gifts and decorations. So we have the, the first trouble is that the dream ego is looking at these 12 puppies in a way that is very initially indifferent, or perhaps they're seen just as objects rather than vulnerable living creatures. And part of the medicine in the dream is that these living decorations which are then used as wall decorations, wind up having a capacity for suffering, wind up demonstrating that they need many other things, and that characterizing them as decorations that could be pinned to a wall is actually heartbreaking and traumatic. The next challenge that the dream ego has is, what is she going to do about that? One of the things that she doesn't do as the dream ego is that she doesn't have the impulse to want to take them and care for them. That somehow she feels locked into this place that the father complex seems to be advocating that the best response to the suffering instinct is to kill it or put it out of its misery, which in essence brings it deeply into the unconscious so that the ego has no relationship to it. So there is an internal world where puppies and mice, and for that matter, dolphins, are somehow inconvenient, messy. There's a certain element of disgust 
which all of us deal with relative to the instinctive level. And the dream ego has not formulated a conscious attitude towards these things, which would allow her to actively care for them and feel that she has the energy to be responsible for them. And I suspect that that is influencing any number of areas of the waking life as well. The father, the internal father at least, and by the way, for the listeners, the father complex is not synonymous with the biological father. The father complex undoubtedly is wrapped up in some memories about that, but also it's part mythology and archetype and movies and literature and many other things. So in this rendering, the father complex doesn't really provide any nurturing suggestions and the mother complex and the brother for that matter are silent. I'm also aware that uh, and I think everything you've said, Joseph, is just so um, really insightful and right on. But she is overwhelmed by these great numbers of mice and puppies and four dolphins that I wonder if there is a thread here about her own uh, instinctive young, vulnerable needs being too much, too many. And therefore, the dream ego says, you know, what am I going to do? I, I somehow have to put them out of their misery. I have to stamp out these feelings. Yeah, that's both of what you've said. I think both of you are, are really uh, just right on and, and sort of picking up on that. I, I think in a way, it, there's good news that there's all these multiples of animals. There's a lot of life here. <laughs> but, I, but I think what, what you're saying, Deb, what you're picking up on is, you know, she says um, there's a part of her that wants to figure out how to care for them. Joseph, you said the ego didn't have an instinct. But I, I heard that there's this question throughout the whole dream of, is she going to be able to take care of them? And and she says, I don't, I have nowhere, I have nowhere to take care of them. You know, there's a kind of image of psychic poverty that she isn't able to care for them herself because she's so embedded in this family complex. They're all in a hotel room and the shadow aspect of things, the pee and the poop, she's worried it's going to overwhelm everyone else. So there's a sense of she doesn't have her own psychic space in which she might be able to tenderly care for all these uh, animals. You know, the other thing that that occurs to me, Joseph, you talked about the, the father stuff, and obviously that's huge in this dream. And I do wonder about this relationship, dreamer's relationship with her father. You know, the father is sadistic toward her gift. She brings a gift of the puppies. As you said very aptly, Joseph, that's not the, the right thing. You shouldn't just bring puppies as a decoration. But it nevertheless was a gift, and her father responded to it with sadism, trying to hang these puppies on the wall and make them cling onto this perch. And it's so heartbreaking that the puppies are, their tails are still wagging. It's like, as you, De Deb, said, about her kind of young infantile needs, she still is so hopeful. Her tail is still wagging that mm -hmm. somehow she'll get enough of what she needs. But in, in, it's incredibly, incredibly meager as the dream shows us. You know, this is really a reach, but I wonder if what she does as a stripper is analogous to that, that you get some of what you need, some appreciation and attention uh, but it might be like trying to hang on to way too small a perch like these puppies, you know, tr trying desperately to hang on to those nails uh, with their tails still wagging. I also want to comment on uh, how these little golden retriever puppies, and I think it is the the mice as well, but the number 12 comes up, and and that is a very um, significant number. We have, there are 12, 12 apostles. Uh, there are 12 months in the year. 12 is a multiple of two and three and four and six. It goes on and on. And so it's a kind of symbolic of a promise here of, of wholeness, 
of a kind of completeness that you were mentioning, Lisa, as there's life here. And uh, that that's part of the telos of the dream of where psyche is trying to go and wants to go and is pointing to. Yeah. I mean, 12 is not just a number of wholeness. It's kind of a number of a cosmological kind of wholeness. Yes. Uh, I'm also aware that uh, these puppies are injured in their abdomens. Their organs are being dislocated uh, because of these little uh, perches. They've fallen off of them. And that she, in her waking life, says, I am also very sick and experience a great deal of distress around illness centered in my abdominal organs. And uh, there's a significance to that. We, we know instinctively when someone, you know, it, it has a stomach ache or abdominal pain, you know, how different that is from, let's say, having the flu or a sinus infection or pain in the joints, uh, that our body parts are symbolic as well as uh, have physical function. And that that belly stuff is, um, if I'm remembering this accurately, uh, it's really the second chakra of emotions and feelings. And there may be some, you know, felt connection in that uh, for the dreamer. And I have to leave that up to the dreamer, of course. Well, building on that, Deb, and just coming back to the image in the dream is the puppies are dancing on a nail in the wall and she's dancing on her nail in the wall. And that there's something about being a professional erotic dancer, perhaps pole dancing for that matter, that one is kind of off the ground and pinned to a very particular kind of frame. And on one level, I can understand, you know, the freedom to, to make a living however you choose, if there are choices involved. And without being disrespectful, because I have had clients who worked in the sex industry um, as escorts, as well as some people that put themselves through college stripping. Um, they have actually rather a positive experience of being able to earn a good living for themselves. But in this particular case, it seems that the father complex has pinned the puppies to balance on the head of a nail. And it evokes an image in myself of her on a performing stage being put out in front on display like a decoration by the father complex somehow is acting upon her and steering her into some of these choices. The other thing I'd like to say is that the, the animals have allegedly been exposed to jet fuel, which has permanently damaged their organs. And so I found myself just wondering about jet fuel. And of course, I would ask her what her associations are. I was thinking about jet fuel being so volatile and flammable and combustible and indigestible, and that when jet fuel um, is ignited, it produces this um, incredibly powerful release of heat that ideally is then harnessed in the jet to kind of move things along. But of course, puppies aren't engines, so they can't make use of something that's that alien. The puppies need milk, puppy food, other kinds of fuel. But jet fuel is too hot, too volatile. And so it's also very possible that the puppies inside of her, and she herself as a bit of a psychological puppy, have been exposed to things that are so volatile in her life and in her psychological atmosphere that she cannot digest it. And one of the signs that we cannot digest our own experiences is that the body takes over and tries to store the undigestible experiences as forms of somatic disorders. Another way of saying it is when we have very intense experiences from childhood on, in an ideal psyche, the symbolic function grabs those experiences and stores them in very discrete images, which we call symbols. 
We continue to interact with those symbols through dreams, and over time, we, we slowly metabolize the intensity of feeling in the image. When the image is too hot, impossible to integrate as a survival mechanism, the psyche then stores it in tissue, muscles, organs, which is very stressful and burdensome. And so we often see that certain particularly functional disorders will spring up, like the digestion is impaired or allergies become exacerbated or the immune system becomes under or overcharged or muscles ache and move stiffly or problematically and, and on and on. So it makes me think that the abdominal pain is part of the indigestibility of the volatile substance, which remains a mystery as to what that might actually experience. And that she really does need support. And uh, Joseph, that was really beautiful and, and wise, I think. And, you know, for me, that was actually the point in the dream I, I think I felt most moved was learning that these puppies had been exposed to jet fuel. For some reason, this sense that that they're sort of irreparably damaged. And at the same time, especially listening to you, Joseph, I'm aware that um, jet fuel is volatile and dangerous and incredibly powerful. You know, what I suspect here is that there's been significant, significant trauma and that the, the jet fuel is kind of a, in, in some way symbolic of that trauma. The other side of it is that it's powerful and could launch us into, you know, who knows? Who knows where we could go? It could really fuel mm -hmm. us yeah. to do something. I have been sit sitting with the idea of uh, trauma also and uh, how trauma can be, it is initiated by having experiences that are simply too much, they're literally too hot to handle. So the, you know, obviously like the jet fuel, it's too much. And so it gets set aside and put someplace else. Uh, as you were saying, Joseph, in the body, it can be stored in tissue. And now uh, there's an opportunity to revisit some of this and convert that jet fuel into um, good use as an adult. Well, and, and the other uh, thing that lends some credence to this uh, is the fact that the dolphins seem to reconstitute and come back to life. That they just need water or feeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and it's interesting because the two ways that she imagines killing the puppies are either too much feeling or putting them on ice, you know, but, but the dream seems to be saying with the dolphins that if there's enough of the right kind of feeling, things can revive. So this is such an incredibly dark, sad dream on the one hand, but I keep on sort of finding that the sort of telos in it, that there's, there's the jet fuel, there's so much life. There's the fact that the dolphins come back to life. They can be re revivified. And water is very often symbolic of feeling. It's a salutio, liquid, uh, and tears are liquid. And so some of them, the mice are drowning in it, uh, but the dolphins come back to life. It, the dream, I think, is really emphasizing uh, the need to reconnect with feeling. It, dolphins are wonderful as an image of uh creatures that come back to life because they live in the water, but they're mammals and they're air breathing. They traverse the realms of conscious and unconscious, uh, mammalian life and life in the unconscious represented by the sea. Uh, there is a very hopeful aspect uh, embedded uh, very uh, vividly in this dream. The encouragement that I would offer to the dreamer is that you can learn to care for the parts of you that are sweet and patient and naive. It may be something that's mysterious at the moment. It may be that you'll require 
working with someone else to provide support or even ideas as to what that would look like. But we don't have to do harm to ourselves because we've been exposed to overwhelming circumstances early in our lives. And I would suspect the exposure of the puppies to the jet fuel suggests that there could have been some early life exposure to overwhelming images of sexuality, which then come back in this drive to work as a stripper or in some way to be dancing with this dark side of sexuality as an impulse to master the thing that you were exposed to too young that was too much for a puppy to have to understand or make sense of. But there may be another way or additional ways to master that exposure to the jet fuel experience that is more efficient and involves more of the mother, the divine mother. Because there is a need for that kind of mothering energy relative to the sweet, patient, and naive little ones that are inside of you. The other thing I want to say that I hope is encouraging is we begin to dream about something that in the past was intolerable because the dream maker knows that you are strong enough now to face it. If you weren't strong enough to face it, you wouldn't have been given the dream. So trauma dreams come up because something higher than our conscious personality has assessed our ability to do a piece of work. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, Help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.